Red Red Pagan uh, with um, AB Men, um, who is um, lo located in Montreal, uh, Quebec. Um, so um, yeah, I am. We want to, wanted to come on here and t uh, talk about a few things that are um, very pressing in our communities. And um, I'm just going to kind of, we're, we're just going to ki kind of go back and forth here. And um, I'm going to actually let him uh, kind of uh, take everything, kind of get everything started. We, one of the things that we wanted to um, talk about was uh, self-defense and um, a couple other things on here today. <laughs> um, so yeah, do um, you want to tell the fine folks? Uh, uh, you want to want to just kind of lead in there with them. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we have to talk about the things that are never talked about. That's the thing that we have to talk about. Okay. So uh, as my tag here says, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a, like a uh, political science doctor uh, from uh, the University uh, du Québec à Montréal. You know, the um, '60s university that was set up here in in uh, Montreal or Montreal. Uh, it's like a revolutionary university in terms of its political science department. And that's where I went to from, from Ontario, from Toronto and Ottawa. I gave up uh, on Anglophone Canada and I jumped over the fence into Quebec. <laughs> I, actually, I walked over the fence because, you know, one winter it was so cold that the, um, the river between Quebec and Ontario was frozen. So I just walked over the ice instead of taking the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> to go to work, which was uh, actually uh, in the uh, Palestine Information Office of the Arab League during the war of 1982 to 1985. <laughs> and, uh, I was working in the uh, Palestinian embassy with Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, where the question of self-defense is very vital, uh, you know, in particular. I've learned a lot from Palestine in, in that regard. So um, my full name is uh, Abraham Abraham in English. In uh, Arabic, it's Ibrahim. So what I've done is I've merged the two and I call myself uh, Abraham, so they don't have any ham in my name, you know? <laughs> 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 okay, so I'm kosher now. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my video uh, going, you know? Somehow it's blocked, you know, even though my <clears throat> video icon says that it's alive. But somehow between uh, my camera and uh, your computer, somehow there's something that has stopped it from transiting the, the uh, ether, so-called. So, <clears throat> you know, what, uh, you know, motivates, I, I think, us, you know, to consider this matter of self-defense is that uh, both of our, our social formations, our communities, you know, are targeted. And in the United States, it's, it's become very acute and uh, most of the uh, mass shootings in the United States have been conducted by white uh, supremacists who are uh, trying to defeat uh, the uh, replacement uh, theory that they have come up with uh, because they realize now that they're sort of losing the majority of the population because there's many more uh, of them than there is there of us, you know, type thing. In the world, you know, like the, the white people are actually just 10% of the whole human population. So <laughs> it's sort of inevitable, you know, that things are going to get mixed up there, you know, and there's not going to be, you know, any sort of, you know, apartheid pockets of white supremacy left anymore in the world after, mm -hmm. after who knows what, 50 years or so. But uh, they're, they're trying to resist this. You know, they think that they can carry off a counter revolution against the social revolution that's happening. And uh, uh, they're serious. You know, this rally that uh, Trump had after its indictment today, you know, was like a fascist rally, you know, like a totally organized, like, you know, a fascist movement, you know. Uh, he uses, you know, the uh, antagonism of the state to motivate people who are anti-state. <laughs> and uh, for whatever reason, he just sort of gets into a folksy mood and talks, you know, with a certain amount of, you know, personal emotion, unlike any other politician. And, uh, and he, and he gets over to them, you know, so they want him, you know, to be their savior. And they even cheer him when he talks about how rich he is. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know. You know, like, you know, like, how does he do it? You know, it's yeah, incredible. Even though, yeah, I think at one point he, I, um, I think I looked into it, and he's got supposedly he's supposed to have a net worth of like two billion dollars, but he's got like four billion dollars in debt. So in actuality, the man actually has no money, which no. is why he has to rely on his supporters for uh you know for you know donations and because you know at the end of the day the man is a con man but even on a bigger picture the man has you know largely followed the Mussolini playbook you know pretty yeah. much to a T. So but um and yeah isn't no, that some, the, and isn't that the whole story of the United States of America as a whole? You know, you know, USA is a con, con game, you know, they're just, you know, printing yeah. money, you know, going into debt to themselves. And so they don't care. <laughs> well, yeah, like the whole like, you know, the, the United States credit system is basically, you know, uh, it, it's just a complete, you know, sc uh, scam. And the whole idea of the stock market is basically just, you know, you know, a form of gambling. So it's, you know, you know, even though technically gambling is supposed to be illegal in most states, um, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Well, <laughs> so um, there is, a, I guess, the, you know, uh, I listened to Jason, Jason Andrews, um, um, uh, Rebel, uh, uh, Comrade Rebel. Uh, and uh, he makes a lot of is, sense yeah. you know, to describe, you know, the uh, the case of uh, Andrew who took uh, his revenge on the school that uh, may very well have you know, caused him to go into trauma. And yeah. uh, he seems to have targeted the teachers in particular, it got three teachers and uh, maybe those are the teachers that were the ones who did the trauma to him in the first place. So who knows? But uh, nonetheless, you know, like even indigenous people here don't, you know, go berserk and and take it out, you know, on uh, on the priests, <laughs> like uh, like happened to some extent, you know, in the Spanish Revolution, when some anarchists, you know, took out some priests, and this became a big propaganda, you know, benefit, you know, for the counter revolution. Yeah, and I don't know if a lot of people like are quite aware of the the total situation. Um, from what I understand, yeah, there was um, uh, potential. Um, uh, sexual abuse um that this uh individual suffered uh while attending this school because this was an evangelical school so you know much like you know a lot of you know uh churches and stuff like that there's going to be you know there's gonna, gonna be some very sick and depraved people that are gonna prey on children there um but that by no means excuses what this individual, you know, carried out. Um, but it is one of those things where, you know, if we're also if we're going to be holding accountable this person, it is important to remind people why this person was driven, you know, to, you know, the mental state that they were. And, you know, it it really also points out a, another interesting fact about American society that while they want to where a lot of people want to call trans people and just LGBT people in general things like groomers etc um, it's they make up only point I believe the statistic was only 0.7 percent 0.7 percent of the actual sexual offenders in the United States and the rest of those have been, you know, are very much statistically cis people that are, mm -hmm. you know, committing these crimes. So, you know, you're more likely to be molested by a cis white, you know, male parishioner, minister, priest, whatever, yeah. 
you know, mm. than you are by a trans person. People want to pass anti-drag mm. law in a lot of these different states and stuff like that because they somehow think that, dra you know, uh, drag queens are, you know, cor you know, grooming and molesting and corrupting their children. No, they're just trying to read stories and entertain people it's not anything sexual it's not mm -hmm. in you know it's you know it, it's supposed to be something warm and inviting and 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 fun for people to to you know see and you know and, and it gets and, you the know, attention maybe, of the children as well i mean they pay attention because this is and some new person they've never seen a person like this before so they're interested exactly. they want to know what this person has to say of course natural and but uh, and the thing that you really, I think there's yeah, a, the thing, yes oh sorry i was just going to add one more thing too another thing that i really that i really find sad about the entire thing is that these laws are in nature meant to be absolutely draconian they are not not just meant to protect the children. If they actually gave a damn about protecting the children, they wouldn't be, you know, these same people would not be trying to essentially lower the age of consent, the, you know, the age of uh, the, the marrying age and stuff like that. They're basically legalizing child marriages in, well, for instance, the, the state of Tennessee. Yet they're trying mm -hmm. to pass a drag ban, which let's call it for what it is. It is a trans ban. And the, a similar law is being is trying to be forced through in uh, Texas. Um, I believe Florida has one too. Montana, I've been hearing about as well. Basically, these bills state within them that it basically criminalizes male and female impersonators which we all know oh, yes i've heard about that yeah, yeah which yeah. basically yeah. we all know translates to trans people so in the case of myself yeah. i would not be able to walk down the street of nashville or memphis without potentially being arrested and charged as a sex oh. wow and at the same time, they're parading out their little daughters out in costumes, you know, in um, in, in show trials or something like that. I don't know what they call them even. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, there's a certain continuity also between the uh, the hate that is generated in that type of, you know, uh, uh, that type of mentality against trans people because they can't accept that there's uh, a continuity between the genders. They can't accept that because they have this idea that there's a cement wall between the genders. And, yeah. uh, and in the case of Jewish people, we're put on the other side of the wall because uh, Jewish men are supposed to be effeminate. They're not real men, you know, like a Christian man would say. You know, a Christian white man would say that he's a real man, and, you know, a quote-unquote Jew is not. <laughs> a Jew yeah. is a Jew, it's not not a real man, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. OK, so, you know, you know, this continuity has to be analyzed further, you know, because this is very intriguing, you know, bizarre, weird thing, you know, because you know, have to bring Freud into this because this is some sort of a sexual neurosis on the part of that type of a society, a Christian society, basically a Christian nation state. And I could continue on this and say, which on the one hand claims it's you know, more secular, more liberal, and more liberated than any other society in the world, especially the Oriental societies, which bans abortion, which is the most important issue for women's liberation, even while Islam does not ban abortion. Ah, nobody mentions this. Judaism does not ban abortion because the women's health is a priority because the women is going to produce more children. It's logical. You know, right. to, for the preservation of social or, you know, uh, continuity. So, you know, Christianity, on the other hand, you know, is uh, it's got this bizarre, you know, like uh, theory that uh, abortion is murder. Right. Right. Even though they would be killing the mother if they didn't do the abortion in one way or another. So 
all of a sudden, you know, the mother is not worth much, you know, even though she's the one who's making the baby in the first place, you know, <laughs> because right. the man is the one who's more important. The patriarchy says that the child is more important to the man than the woman is. In effect, by saying that abortion is banned. This is very, very, you know, like insidious. It is, and it's also very interesting how when you consider the idea of how transphobia kind of plays into a lot of those, a lot of those roles. A lot of people that want, that that call them so, themselves so called feminists and stuff like that um, are the very same people that my, uh, you know, my community calls turfs, or as I like to refer refer to them at the. the Technical term is trans exclusionary radical feminists, but I refer to them as what they truly are trans exclusionary reactionary fascists because they are because these people are not feminists. They do not actually believe in women's liberation. In fact, a lot of these people, J.K. Rowling, for example, they don't actually care about you know, abortion rights or anything like that, their main concern is continuing to prop up, you know, this class division, the, you know, the, uh, the whole thing with, um, yeah, it, it's the, the whole just trying essentially keeping elements of patriarchy in place. And as I've stated many times before, it's one of those things where it's kind of an all or nothing sort of a thing you either are for women's liberation which means all women and all and the idea of women's rights you know or you don't and and unfortunately a lot of these um yeah a lot you know a lot of these you know reactionary fascists you know they don't actually care they and that's and so the idea of even abortion rights they'll stand there on their high horse and claim that they're, you know, in favor of, you know, my body, my choice. But at the end of the day, they're no different than any other right wing conservative. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like they even go after they used to go after abortion clinics. Maybe they still do, you know, they and they try to you know assassinate doctors and such. Dr. Morgenthaler yeah. made the breakthrough here in Canada. And, and got an abortion bill passed. Canada has the best abortion law right now, I think. But uh, what do we do about it? You know, that's the question. Okay, so I think that any sort of a public event that we have, we have to have some sort of security all the time, each time. When we are known to be coming to a place in, in mass, there has to be somebody who, amongst the militia, um, amongst the, um, the guard, the uh, security for the demonstration or a meeting has to be armed, at least mm -hmm. one. You know, in the case in Phoenix, when the uh, Reconstructionalist synagogue was massacred and there was 27 victims and five comrades of the Jewish Bund uh, who were there and they were killed, Hannah, Hannah Toff, one of the comrades of the Jewish Bund, she had arms at home. And she didn't bring even one with her because I don't know why. And they were sort of, you know, worried a little bit about it. They wrote about this, but uh, she didn't bring even one arm, it would seem. And why, you know, because it wasn't nice to bring an arm into a synagogue or whatever, you know, like, who knows? You know, it's just sort of an act of defiance that they were into. OK, they did it and they paid for it, you know, but it still is an act of bravery and uh, martyrdom. And their uh, writings are coming out in a book that uh, we've just compiled together with an introduction. The introduction to the book, the first book, is by uh, Comrade Black Minister 13. This is going to be wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, um, when it comes down to the idea of, of armed liberation, it's actually something that I've uh, spoken in, in, in a passing in a lot of in a over the last year it's part of just frankly as you know as a marxist i refer i often refer back to the idea of you know an armed proletariat 
And this is something that I try to educate and bring to the trans community and to the LGBT community as a whole, because out of there are so many marginalized groups that are out there from people of color to indigenous people to, you know, religious minorities to gender and sexual minorities that want that the very key thing is is after events like this there's always going to be major backlash that comes out of it and i stated after the nashville uh shooting that the that now is not the time for trans people to be advocating getting you know rid of the weapons because all you're doing is incentivizing and enabling the people that already oppress us to continue yeah. to oppress us more. What we need to be doing is actually arming ourselves and actually learning to defend ourselves against the fascists. Yeah. That is why I, and there is a, there was actually a couple of, um, a couple of memes that I have posted on my social media, one of which, and both of them have the trans flag with, um, with a rifle that basically states, um, the first one stating, uh, armed minorities are harder to eradicate. That is just a fact. People that are, that are armed who are already being oppressed stand a far better chance of gaining their, their freedom from oppression than people that frankly do not have guns. As I have stated to people, I would rather die a martyr for my cause than die you know cowering in chains and i'm also reminded of what mao said which is that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun that is something that i have personally tried to get uh, by to my community and basically state that we are not going to make any changes by continuing to vote for the lesser of the two evils because at the end of the day the bourgeois democracy is you know is evil and it's not going to it, it's not going to to change no matter who you vote so, for. <laughs> no way so no way at the end of yeah so at the end of the day the only way that we are going to achieve our liberation is through violent means and as much as that is hard, a hard pill to swallow for many, that is the that is the reality of the situation. It, it's like at the bare minimum, you should have at least a gun to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like use the means that the you know that the current state has to essentially defend yourself because mm -hmm. at some point they will come and they will try to disarm you know, they will try to disarm and further oppress these minorities. And of course, I go after the minorities first and they'll leave, you know, everybody else with their arms still in place. I mean, there's, exactly. there's more than 300 million arms in the United States of America and they're not going to exactly. give them up. You know, it's like so the ban any new arms means that the people who are being targeted can't get the arms to defend themselves, you know, so it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And uh, yeah, states like and, California, which, you know, continue to, you know, restrict certain firearms and stuff like that you know only make it you know they're trying to do it to make things safer for people no you, all they're doing is enabling the people mm. that already commit oppression to further oppress these minorities more so they're not actually helping people they are hurting people Precisely, yeah, because these guys, these fascist goons, you know, like if they think they have all the power, you know, like in their hands and nobody else is going to be able to take any, you know, has any other power, you know, to oppose them, they're going to use it. They're going to use the power because they're, they have, in, 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 you know, in, in impunity. They can do whatever they want and they know that nobody's right. going to sort of go after them. So why wouldn't they, you know, like this kid Zimmerman who came down the street, you know, to attack the demonstration after telling the cops that that's what he was going to go do. And then he goes yeah. down there. And then the and then this Jewish guy, you know, tries to stop him, you know, with the skateboard, Rosenberg. And yeah. this guy Zimmerman, you know, shoots him four times. You know, because he didn't he went after, you know, like he was trying to be gentle, you know, and dissuasive, you know, and <laughs> with a skateboard, <laughs> you know, like forget it. Oh, no, no. 
Uh, yeah. And so that's why I basically have stated that, yeah, these, that the, amongst uh, any of the groups right now that are being targeted, trans people need to realize the situation we're under and need to get armed and protect themselves. Because as I have also previously stated, in the 2000s following 9-11, we noticed a trend. And this trend just continued to change. It was just the people that they, the different oppressed people that were being filtered in. In 2000, in the 2000s, it was basically anybody that was Arab looking or Muslim that was uh, basically considered a terrorist. In the 2010s, that became Let's, I mean, o- overarching, it's Latinos, but it was, um, but more specifically Mexican and, you know, Mexican people were the ones being discriminated against and being called the terrorists. In fact, Donald Trump even specifically stated that he believed that they were drug dealers and rapists. Mm-hmm. And now in the 2020s, the new narrative is that the terrorists are trans people. And so it's you're, there's this recurring trend of who is the terrorist. And as I was speaking actually to somebody last night at work who is not a leftist, but you know definitely is you know a bit more you know uh, more progressive than most. Um, he and I were having a conversation, and I basically said just take out the word trans or the word Arab Muslim the word the Mexicans or whatever it is and put in the word Jew because uh, the, because at yeah. the end of the day it's the narrative has not changed since the and time guess of what the, Trump did today he referred to Bragg the attorney general in in New York as being a Soros puppet as being financed by Soros he brought in Soros God. again this yeah, has been set up you know the Semitic attacks you know all over the United States Maybe yeah, the too. anti-Semitic dog whistle. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It has not changed at all since, you know, since the time of the Nazis. I mean, even going for long before the Nazis, but specifically <laughs> from the, er- the Nazi era going forward, the narrative Trump, has not changed. Trump is, is, just, is, is part of that slime. You know, he's the one who said yeah. that he was proud of his German blood. German blood, yeah. <laughs> that is, you know, like uh, there's only it's human true. blood as far as I know. He's talking about his yeah, German genes, definitely. you know, because his his father was German, you know. Okay, but you know, his children are are sort of a little bit distant from that, you know. Like, uh, you know, why make a big deal out of it? And uh, <laughs> and uh, no, it's it's uh, and and he used to read, you know. I read an account which said that he used to read, you know, uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf as bedtime reading according to his wife. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's true. Oh, no. <laughs> we have to take so, care of this. Yeah. Like, like I said, this man has, you know, it is following the, you know, <laughs> is essentially following the Mussolini or the Hitler textbook to a T. You know, mm-hmm. his whole, re- you know, his whole rhetoric, his entire ideology is based on you know nativism jingoism and frankly just american nationalism it is uh, you know that has been his whole trope now at the same time his whole you know his i you know the trump ideology is also you know largely you know what benefits you know trump himself but he but that he's found that niche in the you know the white supremacist community and amongst you know the fascist community of america and it if anything we already knew that was there he just basically made it popular and to, it yeah. made it uh, made mm. it okay it, mm. you know in a, in their sense to basically go out and and you know let their hatred be known And we have continuously seen this rise, you know, continue and grow 
over the la- the course of the last now what's it been because he started you know thumping this around in about 2014 15 so almost about 10 years yeah i i know i know <laughs> because so. you know the the german american population which is a, a base of support for him solid base of support has control over the, all these states in terms of you know majority of the population you know n- north northwest or no north central us all those states are majority german american you know this the the immigrants from the germany you know unemployed you know w- workers from germany came over looking for you know some sort of you know like freedom and, and they were sent off you know to chase down a piece of land stolen from the indigenous people and, and their national territories and just settle on it you know and claim it as their own and they were given legitimacy by you know by the u.s army and then right. they all these states you know and then they have you know the electoral college to give them even more weight you know disproportionately to the population it's also interesting when you look at um, demographics and stuff like that, because a lot of your um, the people that have his support are in, as you said, a lot of those north, central and those southern states, which are predominantly German dissented or Scottish dissented uh, or, you know, Anglo dissented peoples, whereas the people that he typically tends to oppress and the ones that typically tend to lean more on the liberal you know to even leftist side happen to be people of irish descent in a lot of ways you'll see that a lot in new england and even out here in the pacific northwest there is actually a you know pretty sizable amount of irish descended people a lot of indigenous people and those are so it's interesting how that power dynamic of history continues to also play its part in the growing rise of fascism in America. And so true. You know, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. And if you look at the actual in- military industrial complex, you know, the names of the companies, you know, the mm-hmm. names are German and Anglo, <laughs> you know, half, half, yeah. you know, Oh well, you know, the, yeah, the 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 de- the age old names of the oppressors. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, the fascists will blame the Jewish people for profiting off of war. <laughs> but yeah, you know, they aren't there. <laughs> they aren't there at all. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! Yeah, it's so sad. That, yeah, the same people that also you know make the claim that you know Jewish people uh, basically just control all the banks and everything like that and it's like no it's it's not just jewish people it, it, you know it is just at the end of the day it is just the capitalist class you know and most of these people actually aren't even jewish most of these people as we've stated have been of german descent <laughs> yeah yeah and you know i mean i suppose there are jewish banks in in the United States, you know, but they're probably, you know, in the uh, in the in the areas of Jewish residents, you know, and their and their clients, right. you know, are, are the Jewish community, you know, so it'd be logical, you know, it's just like we have a Portuguese, you know, branch of the uh, co-op bank here in Montreal. It's, you know, like logical, you know, but it's not <laughs> controlling interests of the whole economy of the United States of America, plus its international investments, you know, <laughs> I don't think so. Right. <laughs> wow. So uh, this is good. This is a really good discussion, necessary, and I hope you know we uh, help to educate people on how to defend themselves. And then there's you know bigger questions of what to do with the police, you know, like abolish, you know, and then you know having um, you know community uh, uh, community uh, self defense units and all that sort of thing. Right. Community control, autonomy, and all that. Yeah. And I think as much as there's certain things I could say about, for instance, the um, Capitol Hill autonomous zone that um, w- that was created uh, during the uh, George Floyd protests up in Seattle, they were at least on the right track. I will definitely give them that. They had a, they had an idea that was definitely going going down the right track, and that is the idea of essentially you know community policing if you want to call it that where Mm. you don't need the idea of a police force or especially a militarized police force 
people can actually police themselves and are capable of saying, no, what you did was wrong. We, you know, there is going to be some form of punishment for it. And so they were on the right track. And there has been a growing trend amongst, um, Amer- you know, young, especially young Americans um, who very much more statistically has started leaning more towards liberal or even leftist ideals um, as they start to realize, hey, the American dream, this whole idea of America, you know, of, you know, you if you work hard, you can eventually, you know, ru- you know, rise to the top. They're starting to realize, oh, this is bullshit. So mm-hmm. and that, and it's starting to real and many of them are starting to realize as, you know, they continue to be you know, more and more impoverished and in a lot of, in a lot of cases, even slip into homelessness. This is a big problem, especially amongst the trans community. They, it's no wonder that you're starting to see more of these young individuals turning towards, you know, liberalism or turning towards socialism or anarchism. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for example, um, my partner who is non-binary actually, Um, for the longest time was basically for lack of a better term i would say was pretty apolitical but leaned more on the liberal to social democratic spectrum they were uh, a they were what a bernie sanders supporter and nothing against bernie sanders but you know he still is you know he's he's just a a starting point you know like he's no solution and so um but the George Floyd protests was basically what just incensed my partner to the point where they started re- and where they also started reading a lot more theory, both in Marxist and anarchist theory. And that was at that point where they became an anarcho communist. And, um, and my partner has um, just, you know, I've made it known a few times to um, other people that my partner actually did take place, uh, take part in the what we call the Battle of Portland. They were actually there um, when um, Portland police and Homeland Security was um, basically uh, at the Justice Center in downtown Portland. And so my partner has been, you know, has had rubber bullets lo- uh, lobbied at them. In fact, one huh. could one of them could have nearly hit them in the head and obviously would have killed them because those things, yeah, are projectiles. Here's one right here from Palestine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like they're big and, and most of it is metal inside there. It's just a rubber coating. <laughs> exactly. And when those things are flying, you know, you know, at a person, especially at one's head, if those hit you, that's oh, game yeah. over. And, yeah. um, So my partner has faced down death, you know, because of that, they have been pepper sprayed, uh, Mm. well, not pepper sprayed, but well, and then they've been tear gassed. They've had, you know, they've came pretty much within an inch of being arrested. So they could have basically been one of those people in one of those vans um, Mm. that was being uh, taken, you know, by Homeland Security. So, and this was before me and my partner actually got together. But um, because this was 2020, so it basically my partner has, you know, lived the life of essentially a soldier pretty much because they have PTSD from it. They have horrible anxiety from those events. They do have a sense of duty where they do where they, you know, whenever there is some sort of a protest against racial or any other social injustice. They want to be there, but they've also realized that their role should be a supporting role, a role in providing medical care for the people on the ground, because they just, you know, cannot bring themselves to put them back themselves back in that position at the current time. Oh, yeah. um, uh-huh. And it's something that they've had that they're currently trying to work through in therapy. And it's it, uh-huh. it's yeah, an extremely sad case. 
but this is but that's just but, uh, that's it's it's okay. it's just a matter of self preservation you know because fear exactly. you know is natural and logical you know because i know that i've gone over over what i should you know in terms of my own safety when i was in palestine you know playing with the running you know around you know with the soldiers you know chasing me and and all of that, you know, and getting shot at and just standing there, you know, like waiting, you know, like not even realizing that they were going to target me because I didn't think that they would, you know, like right. stupid stuff like that, you know, like you can learn, you know, from these experiences. And then you overcome the fear by, you know, calculating, you know, the risk factors and all that sort of thing. You know, it's very, you know, it's like a whole way of life. By the way, yeah. you're saying that if, if you go out and walk around, you know, with your hair out, you know, that you could be shot, you know, in some areas now and... and where you're yeah. living, actually? Not not where I'm not where I'm living, but if I were to go one state over to Idaho, there's a potential of me being uh, discriminated against. Not even Idaho, actually. Just actually going over the Cascade Range um, to Central or Eastern Oregon, because pretty much most of that that region is very rural. It's very conservative. There's a lot of Trump supporters that are in those areas. Um, in my neck of the woods uh, of Portland, it's uh, very, you know very much more liberal, very much more progressive. Uh, most of you know, you've got. Um, I mean, you have your areas of pockets of people that you know aren't as accepting. Um, one of the uh, basically, you go over the bridge to it. Uh, a city called Vancouver, Washington, um, and there are a lot more conservative people that are over there. Um, but Portland is, you know, it, Portland is a pretty safe community to live in. Um, I've lived here for five years, and it's also got probably one of the biggest pockets of um, of trans people, probably in the entire country. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, but how are uh, the police? Uh, what are the police like there? Uh, that's another story. The police, are, uh -huh. the police are, I've heard are about them. yeah, the police are basically just about as brutal as you know as any other you know member of the coercive arm of the state. Um, I wouldn't honestly put them on the level of LAPD or NYPD, but yeah, it's. But they are still, you know, just as brutal in their tactics and, you know, and it's just they are uh, they, they constantly are harassing, you know, the homeless here. They're constantly uh, mm -hmm. during pro during the protests, they were constantly trying to break up what were just peaceful protests. So uh, and because they were essentially the tactic that they used is all they have to do is basically declare a protest even if it's peaceful they just have to declare it a riot and then all yeah. of a sudden it's yeah. city yeah. legal uh, same here Moriel. but we we, we we took care of that we sued them and we won six million dollars for 300 <laughs> who were arrested <laughs> so but, also, but you know like if, 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 uh, if i come down there you know with my hair like this you know as long <laughs> longer than your hair you know even if I come down, you know, <laughs> even though I have a beard, you know, like, uh, I would still be in danger, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, in Portland, you'd be OK. You'd be, uh, you'd be fine. Uh, they'd pro in fact, port, uh, people and most people in Portland would probably be just kind of like, yeah, you know what? You do you. Um, but uh, yeah, if you go to like you go over to. Idaho. Um, okay, but you go over to Idaho. That. <laughs> or, or to the, even like the towns of like uh, Redmond or Lapine, Oregon. Uh, um, yeah, then then you might end up facing some discrimination. And because uh, uh -huh. basically once you kind of leave, uh, kind of leave the uh, the city centers and stuff like that and start heading out into the rural communities. Oh, uh, yeah. That, that's Different when it becomes. Story. Yeah. Yeah. Same here <laughs> in Quebec. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, but in any case, I'm banned from coming into the United States of America in any case, you know, so <laughs> I'll never be able to get there. Um, in any case, uh, um, let's see, what what should we gather together as a conclusion then? Yeah, we have to, to take care of our own self-defense because nobody's going to do it for us. 
Same thing, you know, with the Jewish people, you know, like in the Warsaw Ghetto, where my mother comes from, you know, after the ghetto was set up, you know, there was 350,000, you know, Jewish people pushed together in a, an area of about 10 kilometers square. You know, they didn't do anything. You know, they set up, right. you know, this Judenrat Council, you know, that, the, you know, was uh, the, manipulated by the Nazis, you know, who were collaborators who set up a list, who wrote lists of the Jewish people for the Nazis, who were then taken away, you know, with, you know, knowing where they were living and everything like that, you know, incredible. And the Jewish people themselves knew this was happening. And then even later on, you know, they got, you know, word from the Jewish Bund, you know, that they, uh, you know, uh, concentration camps were death camps and not just concentration camps. And they didn't do anything, you know, for 19, it was started in 19, September 1940. Didn't do anything for 1940. Didn't do anything for 1941. Didn't do anything for 1942. And then finally, when there was only like 60,000 left in 1943, they finally revolted and they stood off, you know, the Nazis, you know, for a month. And then ignited the whole reversal of the Nazi offensive, you know, then everybody took heart, you know, like if, if the, if, you know, Jewish people in, inside the ghetto, you know, can revolt, you know, and fight back against the Nazis and win, you know, for a month, you know, time, uh, you know, then everybody else should be doing it as well. And then that turned the tide, I think, psychologically in the world. It was became worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, with the Red yeah. Army finally, you know, pushing ahead. And that's something that, you know, uh, that is, those are lessons that could be learned for many pockets, many communities within, you know, not just the United States, but just, you know, the first world in general. And, you know, it's, people don't realize that they are stronger than they think. They are, that they... Uh -huh. That they're that you know they are more than just you know a person to be oppressed by you know a corrupt and you know unjust system. They are you know people. The problem is is that especially in the United States, people do not seem to understand their worth, and they because the system has just beat them down to the point and has propagandized them to believe that they are nothing more than a servant to, mm. you know, the oppressing class. And it's just, it, so it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, even if it's only, you know, a, you know, tens, a few tens of thousands, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you still get armed, you know, prepare, you know, get, you know, actually organize and actually get out there and resist you know this growing tide of you know authoritarianism that is you know yeah that is terrorizing us and because at the end of the day we are not the, we are not the ones that are the terrorists the the state you know the united states is a it is a state terrorist organization it, it, it that yeah. is essentially what it is it has it was always built to terrorize people and to oppress other minorities. It has been that way since it was created when only rich white, you know, landowners could actually, you know, vote. And eventually, yeah, they gave women the right to vote. They gave, you know, you know, African Americans the right to vote. But that doesn't mean that there's but the same manipulation and intimidation tactics that were used back then to keep these people from voting they're still doing they're actually doing still doing today in fact it has just become more prominent in the last like wow. 10 years by these supporters of donald trump who are trying to uh who are going to the voting booths with you know machine guns and 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 you know, trying to intimidate people, you know, from voting in order to try to, you know, sway the the results in someone's favor. Wow, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, um, I guess there's lessons to be learned, you know, from the uh, pre-Nazi era, you know, when the Communist Party refused to form a united front to the left. <laughs> you know, yeah. And so they ended up destroying themselves. You know, how stupid can you get?
<laughs> thought they were being smart, you know, like that they were going to take over. <laughs> All they care about was the power. They didn't care about, you know, one, the Jewish people, two, <laughs> getting killed themselves, you know, like, you know, how many degrees of stupidity are there? In any case, anyway, we're not going to fall for that. Okay, good. <laughs> Very good to speak with you. Wonderful. Yeah, no problem. Okay. À la prochaine, as we say here in Quebec. Until the next time. Until next time. Okay, never again, comrade. Never again. <laughs>